Okay, welcome. This is Chuck Ridgeway. This is the day where all the technical things just fell apart completely. So we're going to wing it. All right, today we think we've got a great show for you. It's our normal Tuesday live stream. And today we're revisiting one of our more popular topics from uh, that we last uh, discussed, oh, about seven months ago, maybe eight months ago now. And that is BACnet IP. We're just going to jump right into the program. All right. So again, our apologies. We will fix it and post it later, but I think we'll give you some good content in the meantime. All right. So let's just go ahead and get started. Again, what we want to cover today is we want to really, the big thing we wanted to cover was the ability to show you some more things on BACnet from a, from a hands-on standpoint. But before we do that, we thought it was important that we give you a brief review of BACnet IP. For those of you who may not have joined us back in January for our last session, we're going to talk about the functionality of the OCS when it comes to BACnet. Of course, OCS is Horner's series of all-in-one controllers. We'll review configuration of BACnet in Seascape, as well as talk about some of the recent enhancements that we've made to improve even further our BACnet interface for the OCS. And if possible, technical capability allowing, we will go through some demonstrations with you. Okay, let's continue on. Okay, BACnet, what is BACnet? Well, BACnet stands for Building Automation and Control Network. So it is certainly for new installations, it is the most popular network or protocol for building automation type applications. Now, this is a market a lot like the industrial market, which has come from a history of a lot of proprietary networks such as LawnWorks and P1 and Metasys N2 and all kinds of other things. But in terms of standardized protocols, BACnet has become very popular for new systems with about a 65% market share worldwide. So if we take a look at what BACnet looks like, really what you're talking about is somewhere in the building, you're going to have a building management system. And what is BACnet for anyway? Well, frankly, any building or facility is gonna have a number of systems which need to be managed, such as heating and cooling, maybe centralized air from a compressed air standpoint. It might have chilling involved. There's always lighting control. So all of these things require control. And if you can centralize that control and centralize the management of these systems, that's a huge advantage for a facility. And again, BACnet happens to be the protocol that has become the de facto standard for these sorts of applications. Okay, now we've talked a lot on this program about the seven layer model for the typical OSI networks. With BACnet, they have collapsed that down to just four layers. So you've got your application layer, which is your data layer, and then packets, frames, and bits. So the seven layers has gone to down to four. Now, from the standpoint of media, or in other words, what media the network used on, BACnet is pretty flexible. It has seven different media that can be used with BACnet today, including things like LAN Talk, which is kind of a legacy system, as well as Zigbee, which is a wireless system. But the two by far that are the most popular are BACnet MSTP, which is a, a token passing network over RS-485. And then what we're gonna primarily talk about today, and that is BACnet IP, which utilizes IP addressing with Ethernet. From an architecture standpoint, one of the things that BACnet does really well is it allows multiple kind of smaller BACnet networks of various media to all interface and communicate back to the building management system. So in a typical facility, you might have a BACnet IP network, which is over here in one part of the plant with devices that talk directly on BACnet IP. You may also have some legacy MSTP networks, which are RS-485 based, and those can all talk back to the building management system over a BACnet IP to MSTP router, for instance, that'll get it onto the same network. And then even if you have legacy systems like, or non-compatible system, like maybe a Modbus network, you can use a BACnet IP to Modbus gateway, and an OCS can be used in that fashion, to get the Modbus data 
up on the BACnet IP network. So it's really good at conglomerating, I guess if that's the word I'm looking for, data from multiple networks, whether they're BACnet networks directly or whether they're third party networks and getting that data all back and translated back to the building management system. Okay, let's talk next about the some of the key definitions that you need to know if you're gonna work with BACnet, or you at least need to kind of be exposed to them. So that's what we're gonna talk about next. So like a lot of the protocols we've talked about in this channel, BACnet uses an object model. So let's start talking about BACnet devices. What is a BACnet device? Well, a BACnet device is made up of multiple BACnet objects, and those BACnet objects are made up of multiple properties. That's how they're defined. So again, we start at the device level, Within that, we have objects. Within the objects, we have properties. Now, what types of objects can we use to create a BACnet device? That's the next question we want to answer. And there are 54 different object types available, but by far the most common are those you see within the red box there, and those are the basic device object types, okay? Now, the OCS is made up of seven different types of objects. You've got the device object. That's a object that every BACnet device has to support that reports things like the type of device, the manufacturer's ID, those sorts of things. And then there are six other object types the OCS supports, and those are some very common ones. Analog input, analog output, analog value, binary input, binary output, and binary value. And for all those last six that I just mentioned, you can have multiple instances of each of those different types if you need to. Okay, so next, let's talk about services. What are services? Well, services define how devices communicate to each other. And there are a bunch of different services available and they're divided into different classes. And regardless of what communication service is in use, it's gonna follow the client server model. So you're gonna have two devices that need to exchange data over BACnet. One of them is gonna act as the client sending out a service request. The other is gonna act as a server and responding with a service response. Now the OCS is always a server, okay? So it never acts as a client. So it's not managing the building management system, for instance. It is a device on the network. You can think of it kind of as a slave, even though it's really a server. Okay, so we've talked about devices as a collection of objects but it's also important to kind of classify different device types, and that's done using something called a device profile. And these are organized, you can see eight of them on the screen here, and they're organized from the most complex and most advanced there at the top of the list down to the most basic and most simple. So it could range from the computer that's acting as the building management controller at the top, and then it could be just a simple temperature sensor at the bottom. Now, when it comes to the Horner OCS, we are a application specific controller. That is the device profile that we follow. And that makes sense. If you're gonna be using an OCS on BACnet, you're probably gonna be using it to control, for instance, lighting, to do lighting control. It could be a chiller control. It could be compressed air control. It could be backup power generation control. All those things are possible with the OCS and BACnet. And all those things are different applications and doing different levels of control. So application specific controller makes perfect sense when it comes to the OCS. Now it's important that these various devices and types of devices can talk to each other. So interoperability is important. So when it comes to interoperability, there's probably one term that's important to understand and that is BIB. And BIB is an acronym. We love acronyms in, in uh, industry, right? And BIB stands for BACnet Interoperability Building Blocks. So what is a BIB? Well, a BIB effectively is a collection of services. And remember we talked about services BIBs are a collection of services, and by the definition of these BIBs, it helps define for a particular device what BIBs need to be supported in order to qualify under one of the device profiles. I think the next chart will make things a little bit clearer. So across the top, across the columns there, what we have are different device profiles, okay? And you can see applic application-specific controller profile is, is highlighted there, third from the right. 
that's what the OCS is. And so that's across the top. Those are the columns. Those are the device profiles. And then all the entries there along all those different rows, those are different bibs and they effectively list the set of services that are required for a device to support that particular profile. So in the case of application-specific controller, an OCS has to support those five sets of services or five bibs in order to qualify as an application-specific controller. So that's what those are. So if you have a device that you want to be a, you know, you're creating a device as a manufacturer and you want it to be an application-specific controller, you have to support those five bibs those sets of services, and that's true with the OCS. So as we kind of summarize the capability or the functionality in the OCS, we can take a look at, first of all, on the left, that first chart there, that is the list of the different objects that are supported by the OCS. So that's device with one instance of a device object and then the different parameters for that device object are listed in the second chart. So those are the sorts of things, the sorts of parameters that have to be reported by the device object. So it has an object identifier, an object name, which is gonna be the product name. So as an example here, it might be XL4E, an object type, you know, a vendor identifier, vendor name, and then model name, which is the actual part number of the product. So those are the device level details or device parameters that are reported by the OCS as part of its device object. Uh, and then you have a series of other objects. Let's take the next one as an example, analog value. And then the third chart there shows you a sampling of the parameters that are reported for the analog value. You have the object identifier, the object name, present value, so that's the actual value of that particular analog value at this point, and then the units if that applies, and none of the OCS units report units as part of their parameter list. And then on the far right there, that chart just kind of lists the different services that are supported by the OCS. But the key is really that as an application-specific controller, the OCS qualifies with all the necessary sets of services that you need to be that sort of object. Okay, next let's talk about the configuration requirements within Seascape if you're configuring an OCS to act as a BACnet server. Okay, well, you start by going to the network level configuration. So you go to hardware configuration, and then you go under typically LAN 1 or LAN 2 if you've got a, uh, a two LAN uh, Horner OCS, and you would at the minimum, you would need to configure the IP address and the net mask because obviously BACnet IP is an Ethernet protocol, so you would need the very basics at least of Ethernet configuration. And then under downloadable protocols, that pull down list there, that's where you would select the BACnet IP server option. And the very latest server option is 4.05, and I'll cover what the enhancements in that version were in a, in a few minutes. Okay, so. Finally, you have a couple of optional variables that you can assign at the network level. First is a variable you can assign that's a bit type variable or a Boolean that would be used to potentially disable BACnet if you wanted to, you know, on the fly, be able to enable and disable the protocol. And then after that, you've got another variable you can define. It's really a set of variables, four consecutive variables, which make up the status information for the network. So again, just to summarize, at the network level, you have to configure the IP address, the net mask, and then you have a couple of optional variables you can assign to make operation easier and troubleshooting easier. At the device level, all right, so we've talked about the network level, all right. At the device level, about the only thing that really needs to be configured is you need to configure an ID. Now there's also a name that's part of the device configuration, but that name is only used in Seascape and is not sent out over the network, so you really don't have to change that at all. The ID is something that's certainly important because with the ID, it has to be unique on the network. Now one might not be the greatest choice if you have a network with a whole number of units because one is probably about the most common network ID you're gonna find. And then the BACnet port number, the default of 47808 is already in there, again, by default. And typically there's no reason to, to change the, the port number. 
Okay, the final level of configuration is what's called the scanless configuration. Now, with the scanless configuration, this is where we get to choose which of the objects are included or the object types are included in the Horner OCS device configuration and then how many of each of those are configured. So the OCS supports, in addition to the device object, the OCS supports analog values, analog inputs, analog outputs, digital values, digital inputs, and digital outputs. Now you can have anywhere from zero of each of these up to a certain limit and you see the limit listed there in the slide. Now, a new enhancement for version 4.05 of our BACnet interface is the ability for analog values to select the data type. So if you have, for instance, let's say that you are monitoring a building system which includes a pump and you want to monitor pump hours. Over time, the value or the number of pump hours can get rather large. Now, with our previous versions of our BACnet interface, you were limited to integers, you know, and they were literally 16-bit integers. So once you exceeded 32,767, you would go negative in terms of your values. So that's obviously not what you would want. You would want, in that scenario where you're monitoring pump hours, you would want the ability to display a very large number if necessary. So by giving you the flexibility of selecting either real or double integer, for instance, for the analog values, you now have the ability to support those sort of large numbers, which our previous versions of our driver just didn't support. So that's a nice enhancement for version 4.05, and that is the version that's distributed with the latest version of Seascape, which is 9.9 .9 Service Pack 5. Okay, next let's talk about configuration specifics, or at least kind of the, the order in which you would do your configuration for variable base advanced ladder. Because all the screenshots up until now were showing the register based ladder, which is what a lot of people are used to, but more and more of our customers are transitioning to variable based ladder because of some of the advantageous features that are available with that language, including things like structures and arrays and those sorts of things. So, what you're going to want to do if you're using variable base advanced ladder is you're going to want to do a couple of extra steps. First of all, you're going to want to predefine your variables. And the variables you're going to want to predefine are going to be things like your BACnet status. Okay, so that's going to be an array of four double words. And then if you're going to utilize the enable disable bit, then you're going to want to assign a Boolean variable and call it something like BACnet enable. Okay? Now, depending on which BACnet objects that you want to support, whether it's analog values, analog inputs, analog outputs, or some combination thereof, at that point what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to assign a array to each of those object types. Okay, so let's say for example that you want to support eight analog values of the real type. So what you would want to do when you predefined your variable, you'd want to define your variable, give it a name, assign it as the real data type, and then you'd want to give it a dimension, let's say, of, of eight, because you have literally eight analog values that you need to be able to specify as part of your variable array. Okay, and you would do that for each of the other types of objects that you're going to support, like analog inputs, analog outputs, etc. And then once you've predefined your variables, then you would go to the step of actually doing your configuration and your, your BACnet configuration and your hardware config. Okay, so let's see if we can keep things working here. I'm going to go ahead and see if we can switch to Seascape. All right, there we go. And I've got a demo here. I'm going to go ahead and just review it with you. And this is a variable based program. Okay, so that last slide where I talked about the fact that you'd want to predefine your BACnet variables, I've done that in this particular demo here. So let's take a look at our variables first. Let's go under global variables and scroll down to our list here. Okay, and you can see some variables that I have predefined. So first of all, I have predefined BACnet status, which is double integer type with a dimension of four. So that's index 0 through index 3. I have defined a BACnet IP disable bit, so if I do want to go ahead and disable BACnet protocol and then re-enable it again at a later time, I can do that. 
And then in my example here, I am just strictly using analog values, and there are four of them that I'm going to use in my application. And I'm also going to be configuring binary values or digital values, and there's going to be eight of those. And you can see I've created these variables of the proper type and then of the proper dimension for the number that I want to support. So again, I'm going to support four analog values and I'm going to support eight Boolean or digital values. Okay, now there's one more step that you need to make here that's important. Because BACnet is going to be communicating data outside of the OCS, we do need to go ahead and map these internal objects, the ones that are mapped to BACnet data, we need to map those to specific memory locations in the Horner controller. Now it doesn't really matter which memory locations you choose. If, you're, if you've got an analog type, you're going to choose a type R. If you've got a Boolean type of value, you're going to configure to a type M. So uh, the type of reference matters, but where doesn't matter. So whether I picked it as mapping to R1 or R1001, it really doesn't matter. So again, I need to create the appropriate variables of the appropriate type with the appropriate dimension and then map them somewhere in the right or the appropriate address space. Okay, now let's go in and take a look at our, what our configuration looks like. So I go into the hardware configuration. I go under LAN 1. All right, and then I have here my IP address and my net mask are configured. That would be the bare minimum. I've also configured my gateway and DNS server here. And then down here under downloadable protocols, I have configured or I have selected from the pull down list BACnet Server 4.05. And again, 4.05 is the latest version, the one that was um, distributed with Service Pack 5. It's also available separately as a file set, a DLL file, and a help file file that you can get to add to an earlier version of Seascape if you don't want to upgrade. Okay, so let's take a look at the network level. And what's going on in the network level? Well, on the network level, about the only thing we need to configure, and this, these are both optional, frankly, but I, I always recommend that you configure them, and that is this disable bit, as well as the status registers, okay? And remember, we have four 32-bit values that we're going to need to handle with our status variable. And that's why I pre-created this variable called BACnet status, and that's why I gave it a dimension of four. Okay, so that's pre-configured. That's not the network level. At the device level, the only thing we had to configure here really was the ID. And in my case, because this is a demo, using an ID of one was perfectly fine. I left the name and the ports at their default values. I wouldn't want to change the port in all likelihood. I could change the name, but again, this name doesn't get broadcast over the network or anything. And then in this case, I did not add this optional variable for disabling this specific device on BACnet. Uh, because I'm only one device hanging on BACnet as a slave or as a, as a server, it really wasn't needed to enable or disable this device on the fly. Okay, so this was really, the ID was just about the only thing I set at the device level. All right, and then finally, at the scan list level, that's where we configure by double clicking here. That's where we configure the different objects that we want to support and which variables are mapped to those objects. So in this case, the only thing I've really supported is four analog values and eight digital values or binary values, okay? And I've assigned a variable to these that's got the dimension of four. This one has a dimension of eight and that's where my data is going to be exchanged between the OCS and the BACnet network. Okay, so that's what the configuration looks like for my demonstration here. Okay, next let's see if we can go ahead and demonstrate browsing a BACnet network using PC Explorer utilities. Okay, this is something so what we're doing in this case is we are kind of simulating a system using a PC software utility to kind of emulate the building manager. And then the, the Horner OCS, of course, is a server on BACnet or a slave on BACnet, which typically would be used to do something like manage a 
uh, air compressor or a backup generation system, whatever the case may be. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at my OCS here. And on the computer side, I'm going to go ahead and minimize Seascape. And let's go ahead and I will just close this program and open it up from scratch so you can see what I'm doing here. So I'm going to start with a program called Yabe, which I think stands for Yet Another Backnet Explorer. So this is a software package, which let's try something here, which may not work, but we're going to give it a go. Nope, didn't work. Let's go back to where we were before. Probably it'll probably come back here, and then let's try back to the computer. Okay, there we go. All right, again, apologize for the technical difficulties today. All right, so this is Yabe, and what we want to do is we want to add a device for Yabe to explore. Now, Yabe supports all kinds of different backnet types of networks, and what we want is to add a device to be monitored with BACnet IP. We're not, we're not connected to BACnet MSTP um, or any of these other options here. So I'm going to hit the Add button there. All right, and it went out and found the OCS. All right, so it also automatically populated the four different analog values that are supported by our OCS through our configuration. We, it also is showing the eight different binary values that are supported through the OCS application. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a quick look again at our OCS. You can see that our analog values that we're monitoring here, let's, uh, and our temperature is the first one, and that's a value of 92.5. So going back to Seascape, let's see what our analog value looks like here, and sure enough, Okay, we can see under present value, we can see a value of 92.5. Now, let's pretend for a moment here that this is a set point and not a temperature sensor that we're dealing with here, and this is a set point. And if it's a set point, you might want to write this value back into the OCS to adjust the set point. So let's go ahead and do that here. And I'm gonna go ahead and type in a new set point of 100. Okay, and let's go back and see if that took, sure enough. Okay, so the original plan was to show you both of these at the same time because of technical difficulties that didn't happen. But as you can see here, see here we've successfully modified that analog value from the computer side or from the BACnet side. Okay, now also at the bottom of the screen there, you'll see some status information. I went ahead and put that on the screen as well. So. There, even though you're assigning four variables or a single variable with four different elements, even though there's four different variables to mo potentially monitor with BACnet status, uh, there's really only three that are interesting to look at. So we have a good message count, a no response count, and an invalid response count. So if we had a communications issue where we weren't able to communicate over the network, we would see either no responses or invalid response type counters would be counting up, and our good messages would not be incrementing. Now, the way BACnet typically works, and it depends a little bit on the software you're using on the client side, some clients can be set up to continuously poll, other ones are set up to ask for information one time, others are set up for a combination thereof. So that is something to keep in mind, is it could be that in a normal situation, the OCS isn't continuously exchanging information over BACnet, it's basically waiting for the BACnet client to send in a query for it to respond to. Okay, and it may or may not be continuously polling. All right, so let's go back to uh, Yabe here. And let's go ahead and take a look at one of our binary values here. And this one is currently has a pre present value of one. That's the first binary value. Let's go ahead and see if we can change that, which we have done. And now going back to take a look at our OCS, we can see that that first output there, the one that's labeled pump, is now off. 
if we go back into Yabe, we have the ability to change that. There we go. And then back to the OCS, you can see, sure enough, we were able to turn our pump on and off from Yabe. Okay, now Yabe isn't the only utility that's available for testing and those sorts of things. We have a variety of other utilities that are also you can find on the market. Some are free, some are paid. Let's go back in and let's close Yabe and let's take a look at another option. There's another pretty good one. This one's called BackNet Explorer. And this is one that is for purchase, but it is a very nice, nice software program. I'm just running it under the demo license for now but it is a pretty good program. I've had pretty good experience with that. So in this case, what we're going to do, similar to Yabe, we're gonna right click here and hit Explore Network. All right, and we just wanna look at our local network. We'll hit OK, and sure enough, there's the XL7E. All right, we can then right click here and hit Explore, and we've got all of our objects that are part of the XL7, but let's take a little more, let's take a little closer look at the properties that are part of the device object for this XL7 that we're configuring here. So uh, these are all the properties. So as an example, you've got a firmware revision. So you can tell the firmware revision of the OCS from here. You've got the model name, which is, that's the full part number with the exception of the HE prefix for the XL7. Here's the object name, it's called XL7E. And here's the list of all the different objects that are supported by the XL7 based on our configuration. And then down here we have things like the vendor ID and the vendor name. Okay, so this is yet another option for browsing the network. And if we take a look at this value here, we can see our present value of 100. We can then change that if we want. Let's go ahead and make it a value of 200. All right, I'll hit write, succeeded. Let's verify that by taking a look at the value in the OCS. Yep, there it is. Okay, so here's another browsing program for the PC that can be pretty useful for testing and managing a BACnet network. Okay, now these software packages that are commercially available aren't just limited to they aren't just limited to computer-based programs. Let's see if we can manage to take a look at, oops, that's not what I wanted. Well, let's see here. I guess what we're doing here, and this looks like we're looking at an Apple TV, and you know what, we are, because what we're gonna do here is we are going to use AirPlay to mirror an iPhone uh, to the system, and it was connected a while back, but as you can imagine, you know, the phones, they're trying to um, basically uh, save the battery, even though it's plugged in. And here we go. So what you should see on the screen there is you should see my phone along with a app called iBackNet Explorer. So let's take a look at this guy. All right. So what you see there now at the top, that's the IP address and the device ID uh, that the app has is configured for itself. And then the next entry below that is the XL7, which it's sitting there on the same network, obviously. Okay, so I can go ahead and select the XL7, and that should look pretty familiar. We're looking at the same list that we should be familiar with now of the device object, the four analog value objects, and then the eight binary value objects. So if we take a closer look at the device object, you can see it sit there and populate all those same fields that we looked at before. And if we take, for example, uh, take a look at this binary value, which is the pump, it's currently set to active. I can go ahead and change that to inactive. And then if we take a look at our OCS, we can see the pump turned off. And if we, uh, if, without showing you the app, if I click it again, you can see I turned it right back on. Okay, so that basically, with uh, a series of technical issues, that's basically the program that we wanted to share with you for today. So normally this is the part of the program where I would bring in Casey and we would review 
questions and answers, but I, I think all of I have is Casey in my ear. I don't think anybody else can hear Casey. Casey, are there uh, any questions that I need to review with the team? Uh, not that I can see. Nope. Okay. I don't think so. All right. Very good. So since we don't have any questions, we'll just go ahead and end the uh, broadcast with a couple reminders. Don't forget, we have virtual training or remote OCS training that's available October 12th and 13th. We're getting really short on seats, but I think we might have one left. Uh, so don't hesitate to sign up for that. And then reminder that hopefully with a little better technical luck next week, we will go ahead and uh, cover for you part one of a two part series. So for the next two weeks, we're gonna cover some advanced topics on removable media. When we talk about removable media, we're talking about micro SD, we're talking about USB flash drives. And of course, we're talking about those things connected to OCSs. So for the next two weeks, we're gonna talk about some advanced topics re with removable media. Next week, it's gonna be about doing things like copying files back and forth between maybe data log files on your micro SD memory card. You might wanna copy those over to a USB flash card so they can be pulled off and taken, taken off the unit. So we'll show you how to do those sorts of things, file copies, uh, and then file management, deletes, renames, those sorts of things. And then in the session after that, the last one of the month, we're gonna be covering another advanced media topic and that's gonna be creating your own custom data log files or XML files that you may need or may, may want to create as part of your machine control functions. And we're gonna be using a new feature, which is the ability for OCSs to use structures to save data away as a data log file, which might be a CSV file, it could be an XML file. So we're gonna cover that on August 31st. So once again, uh, between now and then, we'll work out the technical glitches, and we look forward to seeing you next week for using removal media functions in Seascape, part one.